John chapter 9. Let's open with a word of prayer and we'll dig into the word. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. You're a great and an awesome God. We're thankful that you're sovereign, you're in control, and you're faithful. We're thankful that you loved us so much, you'd rather die than live without us. And Lord, as we go to your word this morning, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Give us ears to hear, uh, soft hearts, ready to receive what you have for us. Lord, we love you, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, all God's people said, Amen. John chapter eight was a chapter of contrast between grace and the law, light and dark, life and death. And now we come to chapter nine, and we're gonna see another miracle that Jesus performs. But it's really a picture of the greatest miracle, and the greatest miracle that takes place in all of humanity is when someone who is spiritually blind comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. Okay, and then the great, so the greatest miracle of all is that we were walking in darkness, and now we are walking in the light, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we're going to see a practical application. The way last week ended, if you'll remember, that they wanted to kill Jesus. The religious leaders of the day, the biggest hypocrites who've ever lived, and maybe some of us challenge that sometimes, but the biggest hypocrites who ever lived were those who proclaimed to be religious and holy, and they were spiritually lost. You can be sincere and wrong. Amen? You can be religious and lost. And the religious leaders of the day, Jesus was a threat to their way of life. Jesus was the one who came in and taught with power and authority like no one had ever heard taught in the synagogue, and people were turning to the Lord. These guys who sat up in the front with the black robes and learned, earned the praises of people, the guys who loved to stand in the middle of the street and pray so that everybody would see how holy they were. Now people were turning away from them and turning to the Lord. When Jesus would heal people, you know what, the thing about the Pharisees, they got mad every time someone was healed on the Sabbath. Well, they had a, a, a law that they created, not in the Bible, not, not the word of God, but their law, that you couldn't heal on the Sabbath. Well, it wasn't a problem for them because they didn't heal anybody on any day of the week. So I'm gonna prohibit you healing on the Sabbath. And then Jesus, do you think he knew it was the Sabbath? Of course he did. And he healed on the Sabbath to make the point, guys, the law doesn't save you, especially man-made laws will never save you. You're saving... Grace only comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, amen? We're not going to heaven because we're good, we're going to heaven because he's good, amen? So that brings us to this chapter, now in chapter nine, another divine appointment, Jesus, as he's headed to the cross of Calvary, as his time is coming short, he's got months left, as he's heading there, he's never too busy for the individual, and I love that, I'm exhorted by that, I'm convicted by that. You ever been too busy to stop and minister to somebody? Amen? I'm on my way to something really important, and oh, this person's dying in their sins and wants to hear about Jesus, but I'm hungry. Or I've got somewhere I've got to be. You know, our Savior was never that way. And we're going to see a divine appointment this morning that is such a powerful picture. Already in the, in the Gospel of John, he turned water into wine, which was a picture of the blood of Christ, and without it, there could be no marriage feast. Water into wine at a wedding. Why did he do that? Because the wedding is a picture of Christ in the church. And the only way that we can be married to Christ is through the shed blood of our Savior on the cross. We saw in John 6, the feeding of the 5,000, that Jesus is the bread of life. We can only feed spiritually, be fed spiritually by him. Nobody else can feed you spiritually but the Lord, through the person of the Holy Spirit as well. Amen? If the Holy Spirit is not speaking, it's a waste of time. Amen? Amen? If we're not gonna teach the Bible, put horns on the wall, call the Elks Club and be done with it, amen? There's too many churches today where the word of God is you know, fed out in pablum, seven steps to financial freedom and three ways to overcome your anger. Guys, we don't need that, we need the word of God that will transform our lives. And so we're gonna see that the Lord continues to give the word and as he does, people's lives are being changed but then there's still those with hard hearts who continue to reject the word. So if you got your outline, grab it. John chapter nine, I tell the message, opening the eyes of the blind. Oddly enough, my dad, uh, as of this stroke that he just had, he can't see anymore, and it was just an interesting time interacting with him. But guys, everyone on this planet, before they come to know Christ, is spiritually blind. Amen? They're walking in darkness, and guess what, here's the reality. If you're walking in the dark, you're gonna fall down a lot, amen? If you're walking in the dark, you're gonna be going in the wrong direction. And guys, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so we're gonna see in this morning's text this interaction with a blind man, leaving the darkness and walking in the light. First, we're gonna see how do we, how are the eyes of the blind opened? 
How are those who are walking in blindness, how are their eyes open? First, by responding to Jesus. Guys, you gotta first recognize you're blind before you need, know you need sight, amen? Until you recognize you're a sinner, you'll see no need for a savior. Until you're convicted of the way you live, you'll never be converted unto Christ. And so we're gonna see first this desperate need of this man and how God how the Lord responds to it. And then we're gonna see not only do we need to respond to Jesus or recognize Jesus or recognize our need, but then we need to respond to Jesus in faithful obedience. Salvation is offered universally and must be accepted individually. I can't force you to be saved, you can't force me, your parents can't force you, God has no grandchildren, amen? So salvation's offered universally, it must be accepted individually. Jesus is gonna have an interaction with this blind man, and this blind man's gonna have a choice to make, to obey God, listen to his word, and do as he says, or to reject him. And that's the same thing that every one of us has today, amen? We either accept Christ or we reject him. So by responding to Jesus, that's how the eyes of the blind are open. Number two, by making a stand for Jesus. Your transformation at salvation will confuse those who know you. You know, when people see that you, when you've radically been born again, if you've truly given your life to Jesus Christ, you will never be the same. Amen? Amen? And people will go, dude, what happened to you? I, I knew you before, and what happened to you? And guys, that's the moment and the opportunity that we have to make a stand for the Lord. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. This blind man not only is going to respond to the Lord, then he's gonna make a stand for the Lord. Guys, people are coming out of the closet for all kinds of ungodliness. It's about time Christians come out of the closet for Jesus Christ. And quit hiding our faith and don't hide your light under a bushel, amen? Let's make a stand for the Lord. Point number three, by the way, if you're new here, I'll tell you what I'm gonna tell you, then I'll tell you, then I'll tell you what I told you, amen? That's how we do it, right? We need to be reminded. Number three, how else do we see the eyes of the blind open? By having an undeniable testimony. This man was born blind, and I'm, I'm giving it away, but he's gonna be seeing. <laughs> and you know what? When a guy who's been blind his whole life is walking around seeing, that's a walking testimony, amen? It's undeniable. In a few chapters, we're gonna get to Lazarus. You know, if you go to someone's funeral on Thursday and they show up at work on Monday, that's a testimony, <laughs> amen? Dude, what happened to you? Well, that's exactly what needs to take place in the life of those who once were blind, who've given their life to Christ, is that we have a testimony that's undeniable. You know, people can sometimes challenge or question some theological points and they would be wrong, but they can challenge them. But you know what they can't challenge? Your testimony. Here's who I was, then I met Jesus, and here's who I am. Amen? And every one of you has one. You don't have to have the entire Bible uh, memorized to have a testimony. Amen? If you've been saved five minutes, you've got a testimony, and the Lord wants you not to keep it to yourself. How else are the eyes of the blind? How else are they open? Number four, by boldly testifying to an unbelieving world all that Jesus has done for you. Has the Lord done a lot for you? Amen? I wanna hear a louder amen than that, amen? amen. Okay, so you were dead in your trespasses and sins, you were headed to hell without Jesus Christ, and just like me, we all deserve to go there, and then Jesus came and suffered and died as if he lived your life, so you could be rewarded as if you lived his. What a great and awesome God, why would we not shout that from the mountaintop? Amen? Aren't you glad that someone told you? Aren't you glad that someone loved the Lord enough to be unashamed of him in front of you? Do we live in a divisive country right about now? That's a ministry opportunity, amen? Because the answer isn't this party or that party, the answer is Jesus Christ. And we need to point people to him. And then finally, we're gonna see that when the eyes of the blind have been opened, the end result is they believe in the Lord and they worship him, confessing him before men. So let's begin there in verse one of John chapter nine. Told you what I'm gonna tell you, now I'll tell you. So John chapter nine, verse one opening the eyes of the blind, leaving the darkness, walking in the light by responding to Jesus. Now Jesus passed by. Where was he leaving? Remember they wanted to kill him yet again. Don't you love it that the religious leaders just continue to want to kill Jesus? They want to silence the one who's a threat to their way of life. They're very rich. They've used the, their, their religious position to fleece people. Does that sound familiar? 
Watch some Christian television, amen? And you see people that use their position and their authority to, to, to take away from people, and now Jesus is a threat to their way of life. They're gonna lose the mansion. They're gonna lose the best seat in the synagogue. The people are gonna stop listening to them. So they wanted to kill Jesus, and Jesus walks out of their midst. They're unable to touch him because it was not his time yet, not time for the cross. But as Jesus is walking out of their midst, he's in Jerusalem, it's at the Feast of Tabernacles, the place is crowded. He's no, probably, the text doesn't tell us, but typically he would go down to the Mount of Olives to spend time alone with the Father. But as he's walking, he has a divine appointment along the way. I share this with you guys all the time. We have divine appointments every day. Too often we walk right by him, amen? So Jesus is walking, there's gonna be a divine appointment, and look what happens. He saw a man who had been blind from birth. Blind from birth. I don't know about you, but I think one of the things that, you know, if you ever think about what's something horrible that could happen, I think being blind would be rough. Amen? I, sometimes you close your eyes and imagine it, and it's like, whoa. Whoa. My dad's blind right now. I'm praying it's temporary. We'll see what happens. You know what? It is temporary because when he gets to heaven, he's not going to be blind anymore. But you know what? Being blind is never easy. Being blind is always difficult, and God bless blind people. Amen? But being blind in Jesus' day was, if it's possible to use this word, was even harder. There were no Braille books in Jesus' day. There were no seeing eye dogs in Jesus' day. There was no, you know, uh, video, you know, radio in Jesus' day. There were no, you know, books on tape in Jesus' day. And so for most blind people, they were literally became immediately destitute and often beggars because they didn't have a job. They, blind people today have jobs and work and function. And praise God, amen? But there are people today, in Jesus' day, if you were a blind man, you were relegated to being a beggar. Now we're gonna see it gets even worse because when you were blind, we're gonna see why people thought you were blind. Makes it even harder. So here's a man that's been blind from the moment he's born. And have you ever imagined being blind from the moment you're born? Someone try to describe a color to someone who's never seen. Try to describe a cloud to someone who's never seen. Try to describe, any, it just, can you imagine trying to make people understand? And especially when there's no braille and there's no music that, you know, in a lot of cases that's accessible. There's no ability to, for all of those things. So here's this man is in a very difficult spot. And Jesus walks along and others are probably walking by him by the thousands as you know, the Feast of Tabernacles is taking place and the crowd is swelled, but Jesus notices him. And I want you to know, if you're going through a trial today that you think no one else cares about, Jesus has his eyes on you, he knows all about it, and he loves you. Amen? The world may be ignoring you, people may be walking by you, but our Savior will never leave you nor forsake you. He'd rather die than live without you. So here's this man, virtually unemployable, forced to beg, shown little compassion from the world, the man had no concept of shapes or faces or the world around him, living a seemingly uh, worthless, maybe wasted life in his own mind, and then comes Jesus. Guys, there's no chance for a miracle without God. Amen? And when God shows up, he can do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. And so here's this divine appointment, all part of God's plan. Look what it says there. And his disciples asked him, verse two, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Here's what they believed. If you were born with a birth defect, it was because either you or your parents had sinned. So you sinned in the womb. Now, we were all born sinners, amen? But they would go back to Genesis 35 with Esau, and Jacob, right? The fighting in the womb. And they would say, well, he must be blind because he sinned in the womb or because his parents were wretches. So either way, so not only are you blind and a beggar, but now people look down upon you and think you deserve to be blind because you're a vile person. And that sounds like a fun life to be living right about now. 38 years of not only being a blind beggar and not being able to provide for yourself and not being able to communicate and see the beautiful world God created, but now also being ridiculed by the world at the same time, looked down upon and accused. And here's the reality, he probably hadn't heard it so much, he probably thought it was true. It's my fault that I am where I am. What a painful situation this man was in. Not only did the blind man 
live under difficult circumstances, but virtually all the people, including Jesus' own disciples, believed it was his fault. Do you know that a lot of people still believe this today? The Hindus believe, I go to India, if you guys know often, and teach pastors there how to study and teach the Bible, and they believe that your caste and where you're, what you're reincarnated as is based on what you did in the previous life, and if you're really bad, you could be a toad next time or whatever, a pit, you know, whatever. And so they believe in this, and that's why they have these castes. If you're in the lowest caste and you touch someone in the high caste, you can be put to death, and they think it's all based on your previous life. By the way, let me make it clear in case you're wondering, it's appointed for man once to live and then to die and then the judgment. There's no part two. Thank you, Jesus, by the way. Amen? I want to be about it for the Lord, but once is good. I'm ready for heaven. Amen? So there's this ridicule this man is taking, uh, they believe that different sins from previous lives, you know, if you have a lot of headaches, you were disobedient to your parents. If you have pain in your eyes, it's because you coveted someone's wife. If you were blind, you, you, you probably killed your mother in your previous life. See, this is the nonsense. So here's this poor man. He's hopeless and helpless. But did God know before the foundation of the world that this divine appointment was coming? And do you know that no suffering is wasted in the kingdom of God? Whatever suffering or trial you go through in life, God will use it for his glory if you will let him. So here's this man, and he's about to have the best day of his life. Amen? And look at verse three. Jesus answers, the disciples say, you know, they're walking along, Jesus notices him, hey, Lord, did he sin or his parents? As they're walking by, and this man is sitting there hearing this, and Jesus says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Sin was not the issue, but an opportunity for ministry. Sometimes we wonder why, and that's a hard question I know, why is there suffering on this planet? Why does God allow suffering? First of all, there was no suffering on this planet until man chose to sin. Amen? Amen. There was no suffering in the garden. There was no pain, no sorrow, no death. So suffering is not God's fault. It's our fault. Amen? Because we live outside of God's will. Because we reject God. Because we live according to the flesh. All right? Now, I'm not saying the person who suffers, you know, even though they're born in sin, it could be the sinfulness of someone else that causes them harm. But I still believe God uses it all for his glory. And so now he tells them, this is an opportunity for ministry. Yes, this man has been blind, but I want to tell you what, I'm looking forward to meeting this guy in heaven. He's nameless here. But when we get to heaven, we'll meet this man, and I guarantee you he won't be bummed that he was blind for 38 years. Amen? Because God did a great work in him and through him. Look at verse 4. Again, born blind, but born blind with a special purpose. Again, the trials of life are always opportunities for ministry, death in the family, illness, uh, the turmoil in our country right now, opportunities for ministry, verse four. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus' time on the earth was limited, and during that time, he was always about his father's business. For us, as the rope will show in a few weeks, our time is limited. Is your life not a vapor? Amen? I found an old video. Uh, I took a bunch of eight millimeters that I found in my attic at my parents' house, and I put them into a video 15 years ago. And it's got, it goes all the way back to the 60s. And it's got all this stuff on it. I'm watching my sister's first birthday when she was at my house last week, and my mom's 28. And you see my young, the young family, and, and you know, now we're in our 50s, and this is my sister, this is 52 years ago, and man, like that, amen? Isn't your life a vapor? It doesn't seem like, the older I get, I feel like it's Christmas every other month, amen? <laughs> I mean, it's just, time just blowing by. And I, you know, and as I contemplate my dad and being close to heaven and my mom with Alzheimer's and I have memories of being younger, man, it's like, just go so quick. But what I want to do is that I have a vapor of time and you have a vapor of time. Well, Jesus had a vapor of time and he was about his father's business every waking moment. May we be about our father's business every waking moment. Amen? 
Wherever we are, we represent Christ. We're his ambassadors. And Jesus' time on earth was limited. He had an urgency in his heart to touch lives while it was still day, or as my dad would say, make hay while the sun's shining. Amen? You know, the sun's only shining for so long. Let's make hay while we can. He's got a vapor of time upon the earth. Every opportunity, every person that he came into contact with was a divine appointment and an opportunity to reach them for the kingdom of God. Of God. Now, to make it clear, this blind man is a picture of all of us because we were all spiritually blind before we came to know Christ. If you're here this morning, maybe you're invited by somebody. This is not the, the feel good fancy church you're probably looking for. But you know what? Here's the reality if you came here this morning and you don't know the Lord, you're spiritually blind, but you don't have to leave here spiritually blind. The Bible says that today be the day of salvation. Amen? And the Word of God will touch and transform your life if you will just respond to what He is saying to your heart this morning. So we're all born blind, and like the blind man, we have no idea what we're missing. Before you knew the Lord, you had no idea what you were missing. Amen? We shouldn't be surprised when people who don't know God act like they don't know God. Amen? When the world is chasing after all this stuff that is perishing, hey, the results are in. One out of every one person dies. Amen? And and guess what? We're going to stand before God, and we have a vapor of time, and people are chasing after that which is perishing. We're walking in spiritual blindness, and Jesus is the light of the world, and God's called us to be the moon. What does the moon do? It reflects the sun. Amen? We reflect the S-U-N. And so here's this divine appointment. Jesus sees this man. He's going to stop and have an interaction with the light of the world. When he had said these things, verse 6, he sped on the ground and made clay with saliva and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, I'm not God. I'm so glad and so glad you're not God. Amen? But have you ever noticed that Jesus heals several blind men in the Bible and he always heals them in a different way? And I know why. Because if everybody in the Bible that was blind got healed by putting clay in their eyes, we'd be having clay in the eyes ministries. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Well, that's what they'll say, hey, that works, put clay in the eye. You know, the point is the focus isn't on the method, the focus is on the messenger. The focus isn't on the way they were healed, but who healed them. Amen? And so we're going to see here that Jesus does something. This guy's blind. And Jesus spits in some clay and sticks clay in his eyes. You ever got anything in your eye? Is that a fun thing? A grain of sand can drive you crazy. Is that not true? You get an eyelash in your eye and you, you, know, you, you need help. Get that out of there. I mean, it's a deal. So can you imagine this blind guy, he's already being tormented by the world because it was his sin that created this problem and now Jesus, the Savior of the world, comes and sticks globs of clay in his eyes. What is that about? Well, there's several things I believe that the clay can point to in some ways. You know, Jesus is the creator. What did he create us from? Created us from dust. He's the creator, amen? Not only that, it's a picture of how today God continues to use dirt as a tool, and that's us, amen? (laughs) We're just dirt, and God uses us for his glory. But I also believe, too, that the clay was an irritation and this irritation is kind of, it's like what the Lord does with the Holy Spirit. He brings conviction. You start getting irritated about your sin. You start recognizing something needs to change. Now, he puts the clay in the man's eyes, but then look at verse seven. He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. Now, if you got a bunch of stuff in your eyes, it doesn't tell us in the text how, how far away the pool was. It might have been, uh, you know, the pool of Siloam. I've been there. I know exactly where it is. But depending on where he was in Jerusalem, it could have been 100 yards. It could have been a mile. We don't know. But I have an idea. There was water closer than the pool. So Jesus, you got stuff in your eyes. It's irritating you to no end. And you could grab a pitcher of water. You probably get someone to bring you some water and wash it out. Or you can listen to what the Lord asked you to do that doesn't necessarily make sense to you, but you put your trust in him anyway and you go to the pool of Siloam. You know, when the Lord calls you unto himself, it may not always make sense the way the Lord does it, but you need to learn to trust him because he's smarter than us. Amen? Amen? And this is a test of this young man's faith. The Lord told me to go. Will I obey him? 
Will I go where he said to go, or will I do this my own way? Guys, if you do it your own way, you will remain blind. Amen? If he grabbed a pitcher of water and washed out his eyes, his irritation would have been gone, but so would his sight have still been gone. Guys, when the Lord calls us, we can either respond in obedience to him, or we continue to live in the darkness where we are now. So he gives this blind man an opportunity to respond in faith and in obedience. Now it's point number one by responding to Jesus. So how, what, how does this man respond? By the way, it says there, the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Isn't it interesting that the only way that this man could go from blindness to sight is to be washed in the sent one? Who's that pointing to? Jesus is the sent one, and the only way that we can go from spiritual blindness to walking in the light is to be washed in the sent one, in Jesus Christ. So it says, go to the pool of Siloam, to the sent one, the Messiah, the one sent from heaven, and not watch what happens, and this is good. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now that's just half a sentence in your Bible, kind of a big deal for this guy. Can you imagine, you've never seen, you, you probably had to get someone to help you, you got clay in your eyes, and then he told me to go, to the pool. someone help me get there, because I don't know how to get, so people are walking him there, and he goes into the water, he obeys God, he comes up, and for the first time, he sees color. He sees people. He can't believe, he sees his own hands. He doesn't need someone to carry him everywhere he goes anymore. All of a sudden, everything makes sense. Everything he's thought about in his mind, now he has clear understanding. Can, do you think the trip back might have been different than the trip there? I would be singing praise songs and doing cartwheels. How about you? I would be like, are you kidding me? This is the greatest thing. I was blind, but now I see this is amazing. Guys, it's a picture of all of us spiritually blind and lost, not understanding this world around us, not fully grasping it, and then we meet Jesus, and now we see, and it all makes sense. Amen? People wanna know the meaning of life? I've got it for you, ready? Jesus. He is, amen? To know him and to make him known. So this man, who had been blind, responds in obedience to the call to listen to the Lord and to go to the pool, to be washed in the sent one, point number two. Not only by responding to Jesus does he go from darkness into light, but by making a stand for Jesus, verse eight. Here come the religious leaders. You gotta love them. Lord help, amen. We're gonna see the neighbors and then his religious leaders, people who knew he was blind. Look at verse eight. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen he was blind said, is this not he who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Another said, this is uh, like him. And he said, I am he. It's me. They see him walking by. Now remember, blind guys weren't just walking along. They were, you know, someone's helping. They didn't have seeing eye dogs. All of a sudden, he's walking through, and the neighbors are like, whoa, whoa, 38, I used to give that guy, what, is that the guy? It looks like him, and he says, ah, it's me. I'm the guy. I once was blind, but now I see, amen? Guys, again, the same thing happens in our lives, as I said before, that before we knew Christ, we live one way, and then once we know Christ, we live a different way that should shock the tar out of our neighbors, amen? That should shock the people that you know, have known you before you knew Christ. You're a new creation in Christ, everything changes. Do you think when he said, hey, it's me, hey, is this the blind guy? And he said, yeah, it's me. You think he might have been smiling a little bit? Think this guy might have been happy? You think he might have said, hey, yeah, it's me, I'm right here. I'm not blind anymore. You know how many blind people from birth have been healed in all of history before that? The answer is zero. He's the first guy. Can our God do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think? We're gonna find out. Now watch what happens, verse 10. Therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? Now here's the, they're asking the wrong question. Not how, but who is the real question, amen? It's not how did you get your life together, but who did you meet that turned your life around? Amen? We didn't get our lives together. We surrendered to Christ and he gave, made us new creations in him. And so they asked the question, what happened? How did you change? Now notice what he says. 
He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. You know what this is called? A testimony. I was blind. I met Jesus. Here's what he told me to do. I went and did it and I'm not blind anymore. Guys, that's our testimony too. Amen? But he's telling them, and I want you to notice, we're going to see this man's faith growing through the chapter. He calls Jesus what here? He's a what? It's on your Bible. It's in your lap. A what? Really? I need a bigger print Bibles. It says Jesus is what? A man called Jesus. Amen? So he's referring to Jesus now as a man. We're going to see as time goes on, he's going to progress in his understanding of who Jesus is. He's more than just a man. Amen? Now, how did this happen? What happened? The healed man testifies how Jesus touched him and gave him sight. You know, some people, we gotta be careful to make sure that when we talk about our salvation, it wasn't that, well, I went on this, this deep theological journey and I went down and I discovered through my own intellect and my great seeking. I found Jesus. Remember those bumper stickers? I didn't know he was lost. We're lost. He found us, amen? He gets the glory, not us. It wasn't some great thing I did. It wasn't something I attained by all my study. Guys, pursue God. The reality is that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So not us being our great venture-seeking God, but him reaching down to us. Verse 12, they said to him, where is he? This guy heals blind people. I want to meet this guy. What happens when you share your faith and people see your life's been changed? Often they'll want to know, well, how did that happen? Who, who impacted your life in such a way? I need to meet this guy. Now they're looking more for the miracles. They don't understand who Christ is. But he says that Jesus is a man. He says he doesn't know where he is. He says, I don't know. But we're going to see that, that this man's faith is going to continue to grow. Now the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are also going to interact with this man. So his neighbors just want to know how it happened. They want to go meet the man who did it. Look how the, look how the religious leaders respond. Look at verse 13. They brought him, who formerly was blind, to the Pharisees. Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, 70 uh, people on a council, the most religious people of the day. They bring this blind man. Now it was Sabbath, shocker. Does Jesus just seem to only heal on the Sabbath? Do you think he's got a gotcha at these religious leaders every time he does it? I could have done it tomorrow, but I'd like to do it today. I got a half hour. Let's do it now before Sabbath's over. He wants to get their attention. Now notice what it says. Now it was Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay in my eyes and I washed and I see. Now that should be a, a worship concert should break out. Amen? Once I, really, this guy was blind. Praise God. Amen? If we had someone in our church that had been blind their whole life and they showed up next Sunday seeing, I think we have an extended worship service. Amen? And then we're praising God. I think we're celebrating, and it's on everybody's Facebook page. Amen? And so they should be rejoicing. This is the God that they say that they follow, and here's a blind man who now sees this has never happened from a man blind from birth. It's happened for the first time. Now notice what happens. Then some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep what? Really? Really? He carried something heavier than a fig on the Sabbath. He's from the devil. He dared to heal the lame man, and the guy was walking, carrying his bed, and he, they said, you're violating the law because you're carrying something that weighs more than a fig, and it's the Sabbath. Dude, I was lame, and now I'm walking, and that's what you notice? Amen? These guys were tithing mint and cumin and being so religious, and at the same time, they were spiritually lost because they were focused on their man-made laws and not a relationship with the living God. Do you know there's people that have a problem with religion? I kind of do too. I've told you this many times. It's worth repeating for someone who might be new. Religion, relingara, in the original language, means to relink. Relinking sinful man back to holy God. I love that. But what does religion come to mean today? Man-made rules that if you keep them, somehow you achieve heaven. Is ISIS religious? 
They are religious and lost. Amen? Because they're trying. You know how they get to heaven? Lopping your head off. In the name of Ali Akbar. Amen? Look, I'm not a political guy, but I'm thinking we might want to check if those are the folks that want to move here. <laughs> In Jesus' name. Amen? Just saying. <laughs> All right. Just saying. Love them, pray for them, but I don't want to move into my house until they get saved. Amen? Check the knives at the door. We can talk, all right? But the reality is that there are those that have a love for religion, but they're lost. And they use religion to, to put a burden on everyone else. And everybody walks around burdened, and every time they see them, they're, look, they're an accuser of the breath. Oh, you know, and they're going after you. And, oh, I hate religion. It's just a heavy weight. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Amen? He who the sun sets free is free indeed. So here we have these men who are upset because he dared to heal this guy on the Sabbath. Others said, verse 16, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. Now praise God, some people at least are going, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That guy was blind, I knew him, and he's walking around and he can see. How is that guy a sinner? When he, how can he do such things if he is a sinner? You're saying he's a sinner because he didn't keep your man-made rules. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can't heal on the Sabbath. That was a man-made rule. So I either believe you're man-made, but this guy used to be blind. So now there begins to be a debate amongst the people as the Pharisees in their self-righteousness continue to look down on one who's a threat to their way of life, Jesus Christ. By the way, the Bible says that Jesus always brings division. Amen? You're either for me or you're against me. Does he desire everyone to be saved? What's the answer? Desires that none should perish, no, not one. But if you make a stand for the Lord, people who don't love the Lord aren't gonna be happy about it. Amen? Do you see just recently this guy was praying at a town hall meeting and they were rioting because he was praying? And they were screaming, separation of church and state, because he was praying at the beginning of it. And then when he prayed in Jesus' name, they lost their minds. You're either for him or you're against him, amen? There's division because of Christ. So they said to the blind, verse 17 again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? Now the first time he said Jesus was a what? Man, here he says he is a what? He's a prophet. As he has more exposure to Christ, as he's meditating on what the Lord has done, He's starting to recognize that Jesus isn't just a man. Now he's a prophet. By the way, prophet isn't enough. Amen? If you just believe Jesus is a prophet, you haven't gotten there yet, but you're moving in the right direction. Amen? He's not just a man. He is a prophet. A prophet is one who foretells the truth. He's the one who tells the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So he makes a stand for the Lord. He says he, what he did. He testifies. Now he proclaims in front of the religious leaders that Jesus is a prophet, the very man they say that they want to kill, the man that they say broke their laws. Point number three in your outline. Long with how, when he opens your eyes, not only do you make a stand for Jesus, but you have an undeniable testimony. Look at verse 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. When God does something miraculous, too often the world just doubts it altogether. And so they challenge it. But I love that a faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And you can put my faith to test and I can tell you exactly what God's done in my life. You may not choose to believe me, but it's true anyway. And so they tried to doubt and say, well, he, oh, he must not have really been blind then because that guy can't be right because he did this on the Sabbath. And of course, the Sabbath is the day of drudgery and hiding in your house and being able to do anything, which is what God won on the day of rest, by the way. Amen. And so this thing happens, and now he did it on that day, and now they're challenging him. But notice what he says. Until they called his parents of him who had received his sight. Often when you make a stand for the Lord, people are not only going to question you, but they're going to question people that know you. Dude, what happened to Tim? You know Tim? I remember we used to hang out. You know what happened? Have you seen him late? What happened to him? And you're gonna say, and if you know him, you go, dude, he's he's on fire for Jesus. That's what happened. Amen. He came to know the Lord. Amen. 
So they're calling his parents, and they know, the parents maybe know that he was blind when he was born. Do you think they might have known this man's testimony? So they call in, son, now watch what happens. They asked him saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How does he now see? Verse 20, his parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and we know that he was born blind. By what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, uh, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him, he will speak for himself. Now why don't the parents just say it was Jesus? Let me tell you why. In those days, if you, at this point, they knew if they aligned with Jesus, they would be kicked out of the synagogue. If anybody said they were a follower of Christ, out of the synagogue. Now you might say, who cares? They can keep the synagogue. But you understand something, if they're kicked out of the synagogue, they could not buy and sell with other people who are of the synagogue. Their lives would be under attack. But you know what, guys? I would pray that we'd be so in love with the Lord, we wouldn't care how much of attack was coming. We would stand for Jesus anyway. Amen? If I lose my job for standing for Jesus, that's okay. He'll still provide. Let's be faithful. Let's honor God above everything else. So they ask him, and they're like, well, well we, you know, out of fear of the Pharisees, out of fear, they don't want to say, uh, so just go ask him. They pass the buck a little bit. Look at verse 22. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already, if anyone confessed that he is the, was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Again, a faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. If you melt every time your faith is questioned or challenged, I want to exhort you, you know what? Your faith is not where it needs to be. Amen? Amen. Confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. Is it always easy to stand up for the Lord? Let's be honest. What's the answer? No. And you know when the, you know when the Holy Spirit's prompting you, don't you? You know when, it, say it. Amen? I've had the Holy, Holy Spirit head slap. Say it, Dave. Say it. Amen? <laughs> Preach it. Bring it. Don't be afraid. Say it. Speak up. I have, I have a, and we get, we get a little, we wimp out in front of men. Isn't it easier to pray for men than it is to witness to them? Because it's easier to talk to God about men than it is to talk to men about God. And the reality is that here's this opportunity, and his parents just kind of, you know, they wimp out underneath it. And then we don't know, go ask him. You can ask him, he'll tell you. Verse 23, therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So he's got an undeniable testimony because his parents said, he was born blind, and yes, he sees, and we don't know how it happened, but we know that it happened. And there are even those that will testify that your life has changed, even though they didn't fully understand how. They just know, I knew him before, he was a party animal, out of control, his life was a mess, and now all of a sudden he's, on, he's a responsible, faithful, kind, loving, gracious man. What in the world happened? I don't even know. But that's still testifying to what Jesus did. Amen? That's what his parents do. Point number four. Now watch what he does. Here's where this young man, this 38-year-old man, is going to kick it into gear. So they again called the man, verse 24, who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Glorify God and say that God is a sinner. That's what this sentence just said. Amen? Ali Akbar, we're praising God and we're killing people. Guys, that's not giving glory to God. Amen? And you're not giving glory to God if you call Jesus Christ a sinner. You can call anyone else a sinner who's ever lived, you know, including yourself, including me, but Jesus Christ is the only one who's never been a sinner, amen? But call him a sinner. Call him a sinner. We want you to call him a sinner. And he's saying this to the man who was healed by Jesus. Now watch this guy. I love this guy. He's been walking around seeing for a short amount of time, but man, this guy's growing in his relationship with God in a hurry. Notice what happens, because this guy gets bolder and bolder by the minute. You give God the glory, have an oath of truth. The Pharisees said, agree with us or face the consequences. We know this man is a sinner. You better get on the right side now or you're gonna have some problems. Verse 25, I love this. He answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know, but I know one thing. Though I was blind, now I see. Hey, you say he's a sinner, I don't know about that. All I know is this, this morning, blind. This afternoon, seeing. 
Here's who I was and here's who I am and you may call him that, I'm not so sure about, guess what, he's gonna get more confident as it goes. But I love that he is, he's not worried about what the Pharisees think. And we gotta stop, now again, we need to love people, be gracious, don't be self-righteous. We're one beggar leading another beggar to the bread. But we gotta stop be, worrying about being politically correct and start being biblically accurate. Amen? Well, I'm afraid I'm gonna say that. You're gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna cause me, I'm gonna have to go color in a book and cry if you talk to me like, guys, we need to preach the truth in love, amen? Don't, don't you know, that's a micro, what's it, a micro, what's it called? A micro what? A microaggression. That's a microaggression. You, you offended me. The cross of Christ is a stone of offense. Amen? Offend me with the gospel. Please. Amen? And so here we have it. And this man, he's not knuckling under. He's been, t- do you think some of these Pharisees might have come by when he was blind going, you're blind because you're a sinner. Think that might have happened? I, I'm pretty confident it probably did. Amen? Weren't these guys quick to point at everybody's sin? Well, you know why you're like that. You're a sinner. Either that or your parents. Your family's a mess. You know, he'd been hearing that, and now they're questioning him, and he's like, I don't know, but I'll tell you what. I was blind. I'm not blind anymore. And by the way, none of you healed me. Amen? Verse 25. He answered and said, whatever he's sitting, verse 26. Then he said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Again, the question continues to be how instead of who. And now what he says is this. He answered and said, I told you already, you do not listen. Why do you not hear it again? Do you also want to become one of his disciples? Bring it, brother. I want to have a sandwich with this guy in heaven. How about you? You want to be one of his disciples too? Now, in the previous chapter, what did Jesus call these same guys? What did he call them? Brood of vipers, sons of the... Sons of the devil, that was pretty popular for the black guys in the black robe, but we're the most religious people. Imagine going up to the Pope, you're a son of the devil. Pretty much what he did. I just see veins popping in necks, head gaskets. And now this guy says, well, you keep asking questions about him. Is it because you want to be one of his disciples too? Is that why? I, you know, can't you see it? Heads popping. God bless this man, Amen. He's not afraid, oh, they won't let me in the synagogue? They didn't let me in before. <laughs> Matter of fact, if I, if I was too close to begging outside, they made me move. I don't, you keep it. I'll follow that guy. Amen? I love this. Such a great picture. Verse 28, they reviled him and said, you were his disciple, but we're Moses' disciples. Poor Moses. <laughs> Amen? If you could be grieved in heaven, mo- hey, oh, uh, uh. this is pr- more proof that they're not watching us because there's no crying in heaven. <laughs> Amen? Because if they're, wa- they'd be like, oh, you got to be kidding me. The only person to be more grieved than Moses or Abraham would be Mary. Stop praying to me. Stop it. Don't make statues of me. Stop it. I'm not the co redeemer with Jesus. Stop it. Amen? We're, we're followers of Moses. They speak cutting words and say they're of Moses. Verse 29, we know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. They don't know where Jesus is from. How, how many times has Jesus told them who he was, why he came? They knew his, ba- but they continue to put their head in the ground and deny Jesus Christ and act as if they don't know anything about him. They're ju- so they're judging a man they don't know anything about having knowing nothing about him. It's kind of like the people that love to tell me about my faith who've never read the Bible. Don't you love that? Uh, you know, I'll start talk- I love airplanes. I love, you know, captive audiences. I love that. And I'll start talking about the Lord and they'll go, I don't believe in God. There is no God. Okay, great. What makes you believe that? I just, well, the Bible is filled with contradictions. Name one. I love- Have you read the Bible? You've read the Bible? Sometimes they'll lie to you because they the, haven't read the Bible and know that lying is wrong, amen? <laughs> but they'll lie to you and they'll say, well, yeah, I've read it. And I'll say, well, give me the theme of the Bible then. I can do it, amen? The whole Old Testament points to the Savior who's coming and Jesus came and fulfilled it all, amen? There's the Bible, ready, go. Now, 
They've never read it, but their authority on it, they reject it. They don't know Jesus, and yet they're judging him when they're the ones who should be examining their own hearts before God. Look what happens in verse 31. Oh, verse 30, excuse me. The man answered and said to them, why this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. So you're the religious leaders, and this guy's healing me, and you don't know anything about him? I thought you guys were the religious leaders. I thought you guys were the authority on the word of God. So he's healing me, but you don't know who he is? That's interesting. A little sarcasm here from the newly sighted guy, amen? I love this guy. Verse 31, now we know that God does not hear sinners. This is the, now watch this guy dropping some theology on him. He says, now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of of God, his will, and and does his will, he hears him. So the Bible says in Psalm 66, 18, if you regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear me. People who don't know God and pray, unless it's a prayer of, of asking for salvation, might as well be yelling down a well. We come to the Father in the name of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit, Amen. There's only one intercessor between man and God. It's not Muhammad, amen? It's Jesus. And so when the world says, you know, and you know, you have coworkers, I've talked about this. I'll think people, I call my boss, and people from work are texting me, I'm thinking a good thought for you. I'm like, well, that's, I, I appreciate the sentiment, but that ain't gonna do anything, amen? I appreciate the sentiment. They're saying, hey, I feel for you, Dave. I appreciate that. But you know what's better? We're going to go intercede with the creator of the universe on behalf of your dad. Amen? That can bring the miraculous. And here we have these guys, and he's saying, you don't know who he is? But he doesn't hear sinners, but he hears those who worship him. And guess what? He heard him. You're saying he's a sinner, but God heard him. And guess what? He heard him enough that I used to be blind, and I'm not blind anymore. Verse 32. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. Who might know that more than anyone else? Someone who was born blind. You think they might have chatted up other blind guys? Have you ever heard anybody getting better? No. It's never happened. You go to the, you know, the support group. Anybody seen that wasn't seen? No. Anybody ever? No. Born blind? No. So this guy is speaking with authority that this has never happened, ever. And now what happened, and you know what happened? Jesus happened. Amen? Amen? And give him the glory. If this man were not, no, were not from God, he could do nothing. Is this guy growing in his faith by the minute? If this guy were not from God, he couldn't have done this. He did this as proof that he's from God. You're calling him a sinner. You're wrong. Keep your synagogue. Amen? I'm going to follow him. I'm not going to follow religion. I'm going to have a relationship with Jesus. Amen? I've got to pick it up as we finish up here. Three times in Isaiah, the, it says that the Messiah would open the eyes of the blind. It's in Isaiah 29, 18, Isaiah 35, 5, Isaiah 42, 7. Now, these guys he's talking to, aren't they the people who are supposed to be the Old Testament scholars? Some of these guys probably made copies of the book of Isaiah. And you think that it's in there three times that he would open the eyes of the blind and now the blind man for the first time ever has had his eyes opened. You think that Messiah bells might be going off. (laughs) Amen? Dude, that's the, we've been, it said, he, go find that guy. Instead, it's kill that guy. We're living in a world that hasn't changed much. Finally, it says, they, they answered and said to him, you were completely born in your sins and you're teaching us and they cast him out. Why did they say he was born in his sins? Because he was born what? You were born in your sins and you're lecturing us. Pride goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. Amen? Final point, opening the eyes of the blind, leaving the darkness, walking in light by believing in the Lord and worshiping him. Watch these two different responses. Verse 35, Jesus heard they had cast him out and when he found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? So this man, he not only heals him, but now he's been thrown out of the synagogue and Jesus goes and finds him. Don't you love our Savior? He leaves the 90 and nine to go find the one, amen? 
He's the good shepherd. Guys, if you feel like you've been cast out, there's someone who's coming to find you, someone who wants to minister to you, and his name is Jesus Christ, amen? And watch what happens. He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? So his theology wasn't all, all the, he knew that Jesus was from God, but now Jesus says, if you believe in the Son of God, and he said, well, tell me who he is, and I'll believe, because I know you're from God, so tell me who he is, and I'll believe. You know, there's people that need to be told who he is, that they might believe, amen? And guess what, that's our job. He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe? And Jesus said, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And how does he respond? He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And I wanna say this very clearly. True belief will be followed by worship. Amen? By the way, some of you might not know this, church starts at 10. <laughs> 10. It's, and it's not the warm-up for the message. Amen. Amen? You know I love you guys, amen? I love you, you're my family, love you. When we get to heaven, are we gonna study the Bible? Are we gonna, are we gonna evangelize? Take any theology classes? We are gonna worship. Amen? You want to get a taste of heaven? Worship. Guys, you get to the movies on time. You get there early, you get your popcorn and coke in a good seat. Sometimes to watch the very sins Christ died for. But then we get here late to worship God. Amen? I love you. Final few verses. And G it, it says here, Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? About time they ask a valid question. And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin, but now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. Here's what he's saying. If you recognized that you were a sinner, you would be forgiven. But because you don't think you're a sinner, your sin remains, amen? You must recognize your sinner before you'll see the need for a savior. So in closing, opening the eyes of the blind, leaving the darkness. First, we need to respond to Christ. Recognize our desperate need, respond to him. Make a stand for him, confess him before men. By having an undeniable testimony, not just praying a prayer and then going out and living the same life you've always, always lived, there ought to be a transformation in who we are. By boldly testifying to an unbelieving world all that Jesus has done for you. Guys, he died on a cross for us. He hung on a cross for us. Can we not stand up for him? And then finally, by believing in the Lord and worshiping him. So with that, let's pray and then we're gonna worship the Lord because he's worthy to be worshiped and to be praised, amen? Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. Thank you for everyone who's here this morning, none by chance, all by divine appointment. Lord, I ask if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know you, that today would be the day of salvation. If you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. Like this blind man, the clay's been put in your eyes and you recognize that something's wrong. But now the Lord says, Go be washed in him. If you confess him right now, you can be forgiven. You'll be a new creation in Christ. You'll be born again. You're going to heaven. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm not asking you to join a church, but to surrender your life to him. If you're here this morning, you've never done that. You know you're a sinner. And like this blind man, you want to confess him as savior. Anybody at all, raise your hand. I'll pray with you and we can know for sure you're going to heaven. Anybody. Today's the day of salvation. Don't leave birth without him. He's a great and awesome God. Lord, we do, we love you, we praise you. You're so worthy of our worship. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. let's worship, amen?